Welcome to Crossroads. I'm Erica, if we haven't met, and we are starting a brand new series today called Like a Boss, and it's going to be super fun. We are going to be talking about work and just asking questions like, do we have purpose or value in our work? What does God say about all of this? And what if we could find all of our fulfillment in God and bring that to our work instead of working to find fulfillment. And one of God's greatest works is his faithfulness to us. So we are going to sing about his faithfulness together right now. And this song just says, because of God's great love and his faithfulness, that we will not be consumed and we are not alone in life or in our work. So you guys stand up. And while you're standing up, Squish to the middle of your sections and fill in the empty seats. We're not full right now, but we will be, so I apologize. <laughs>
Hey, I'm Chuck Mingo, and I'm the campus pastor here at Oak League. Excited to have you guys here. We're kicking off a new series today called Work Like a Boss. And maybe you've been invited by somebody to the series because we're talking about something that's relevant to all of us in the room. Or you've just been checking Crossroads out for a couple of weeks. I just want to say a special welcome to you. We're excited that you're here. Whatever your thoughts are on God, church, we hope today and believe that today you're going to hear something to be very, very helpful and relevant for tomorrow at work, whatever that work is for you. Um, you know, while we are in here having an experience, I want to talk to you about some work that's going on in other, other parts of the building. We really value culturally current communication, and we want to communicate about God and Jesus in language that everybody can understand. And that means being very immersive in here, being intentional about how we communicate in here. But also, right now, if you had little ones when you came this morning, you may have dropped them off in the northeast corner of the building at an amazing environment just for them called Kids Club, where right now kids are being invested in... And there are workers over there helping kids have fun, connect to God, um, understand their partner's story, along with some goldfish and graham crackers. And it is amazing. Jesus goes really well with goldfish and graham crackers. Awesome. At least in my household, that works. And so excited about what's happening in Kids Club. Also, if you have students, junior high, senior high, they may be over at the backside. Middle school right now is having an experience. And for us, middle school is an environment where middle schoolers can connect build relationship and learn about God. They're having a block party that's coming up, a back-to-school block party. Information about that is in your program, parents, if you want to make sure your kid is there. And whether it's high school, middle school, or kids club, we want kids to connect to Jesus in language they can understand, and that's happening, and we get excited about it. So we're starting a new series today called Work Like a Boss, like I said, and we're having some fun in social media coming into this series. And so some of you may have seen on Facebook, if you follow Crossroads on Facebook, that we put out a little survey, what kind of boss are you? It's kind of like one of these BuzzFeed surveys. Definitely check that out. I did it, and turns out that I am most like this guy when it comes to being a boss. I'm like Noah. I'm like, Noah, hell yeah, you're on a boat. You're straight up biblical, courageous, faithful, and a little bit musky. And I'm sure my wife would say at certain times of the day, all three of those are true for me. So that's who I am as a boss. Go take that uh, survey. It's a lot of fun. And we're going to be doing more things like that throughout the series because work is something we all can connect to and are impacted by. One of the other things we do around here regularly to fuel the work, to fuel ourselves in the work that God's called us to as a community and, and the work we do outside of here is we gather once a month for something called Last Wednesday. And Last Wednesday is a time to recharge, to connect a little bit deeper with each other. We sing more songs at that gathering. We also have communion there. And this Wednesday, I'm going to be talking specifically about the unique work of the Oakley campus in the context of what God's doing in our city. I'm excited for you guys to be there and hear that because you're a part of some amazing things God's doing. And um, also, in addition to meeting at all of our other sites for last Wednesday, we do also have a last Wednesday on the east side of town. Any east siders at the 10 o'clock service? Got a couple of them? A couple of them. Well, you know if you're on the east side, and if you don't, get connected. There's a growing community over there of crossroaders who are reaching their neighbors and friends. And part of that is getting together every last Wednesday They're doing it at the Anderson Center this month. It's been a challenge to kind of find a place to land. The Anderson Center, if you're from the east side, you know that's used for a variety of things, theater performances, all kinds of stuff. Turns out God made it this way. It is available every last Wednesday between now and the end of the year. So we've got that thing locked down, and we will be having last Wednesday on the east side at the Anderson Center every month, and just exciting things happening there. Well, this is the part in our service where we fuel financially the things that God calls us to work on as a community. So we're going to have a chance to be generous, and you can be a part of that in a couple of ways. We have volunteers that will be coming down with bags, and you can give cash or check that way. Many of us, more of us, actually are giving electronically, be that online at crossroads.net, where you can set up recurring giving. Or we have a smartphone app, and we're downloading that, and we're giving in the service, and that's a way that you can give as well. So today, as we begin this new series and we're talking about work, we wanted to give you a picture of some of the great work that happens in Kids Club, since many of us don't get to experience that personally. And to do that, we thought we'd dig in the archives a little bit and take a look at a video that makes it very clear why we need Kids Club and how Kids Club is different than what happens in here. So hope you enjoy it, and we're glad you're here. Brian Tome is a real pastor, not a kids club volunteer. So to help explain biblical principles to kids, we hired a kids club leader. There's this person in the Bible, it's called the prodigal. The story is known as the prodigal son, where the son goes away from the father and says, I wish you were dead, and goes away and runs away. And God, the father, the only time in the Bible we see God running, he runs 
after the lost son. <laughs> elbows runs. Do you remember that movie Finding Nemo where the little fish Nemo uh, ran away from his father to go have adventure in the big ocean? Well, we're kind of like little Nemo and God is like Nemo's father and he goes after him because he loves him so much. to learn about Jesus and God and how they help other people. Prayer is important, but it isn't about memorized by rote things that you mindlessly say. It isn't about incantations that you just go after over and over and over again. It's when you get serious about your spirituality. Prayer is just a nice big word to say that we can talk with God. And we can talk with God whenever we want to because He loves us. I love serving in Kids Club because not only do I get to have fun with all of your wonderful children, but I also learn about God and help your kids learn about God. Hey, we're in fourth grade right now and we're having a blast in here. Everybody can learn that they're loved and come to know Jesus. You just have to do it on their terms. I like Kids Club because in Kids Club we get to learn about God and we do fun activities and we sing and dance. And we learn about how you can get baptized and get become closer to God. The B-I-B-L-E, that's a book for me. <laughs> Kids Club, real kids, real teaching just for them. Wow. That was eight years ago. You people have made me old. I'll tell you what. Over the last eight years, I've been working like a boss in this place. You guys have been uh, working me to the bone. You guys are like sandpaper on my nerves. You're like a reamer up to my nostrils, making me age way, way too early. Hey, if you're brand new to Crossroads, welcome. It's wonderful having you here. Well, we are uh, going to be starting a series, starting a series on working like a boss, valuing work, going after it, because it's a lost character quality to love work. And no matter what your work is, you can do it like a boss, whether your work is folding laundry at home, whether your work is making cold calls on the phone, whether you put blue knee-high socks on and you work with the postal service, you can work like a boss. the doors, all the eyes, they are peeping, ride the elevator up to avoid the bosses creeping, put my lunch in the fridge, then I grab a cup of coffee, start my day with hello to the office paparazzi, I'm greeted at my desk with renegotiated terms, asset allocations and some budget concerns, I rock this TPS like a genius, and with no added stress, fix a hole in my dress, I work seven days a week, 365, just to pay for gas and the whip that I drive, when I don't get promoted, I refuse to be cross. Just hold my head high, shake a hand and walk out like a boss I'm coming like a boss at your face Don't turn away or your missus I run this place like an animal I wash animals. I'm changing diapers like the pit crews on the NASCAR channel I pull this hefty shin set like nobody else And then I pause and take a look at myself Cause I'm rocking a sweatpants fashion like Kardashian With these coupons in my hand that cost some slashing them The peanut butter's on the bed stacked high like a mountain And the juicy juice is flowing like a crystal fountain I made tonight's dinner with a canned red sauce So I sit my chamomile and put my feet up on the table like a boss
I'm the man with the M to the A-I-L I come in rain, sleet, snow, tornado, and hail I braid the frozen tundra to get what you need And walk away with a smile when your dog makes me bleed There when you need me, I'm gone when you don't Deliver on time when the UPS won't I know what you got from the QVC And the brown paper cover, it ain't fooling me I've got calves like Adonis from walking your block Covering miles that stretch from here to Bangkok When the children see me coming they sing my praises The birthday checks from grandma put smiles on the faces Lunching in my jeep with some sweet duck sauce Five miles an hour with a sideways lean like a boss So today we're going to look at rolling like a boss and specifically reclaiming the value of work that if we don't reclaim it, there's going to be something that's really gone dark in our relationship with God and something that won't get done that God actually wants us to do. So let's pray before we go any further. God, you're, you're good to give us this time. And I know the people in here, they could be a bunch of different places, but they're here right now because they're wondering if you're real and wondering if you have anything to say that might equip us and draw us close to you. And I pray that that's exactly what happens today. We'd be a little bit different as a result of what we're experiencing right now and that we would be equipped to live life on Monday and the rest of the week in a way that is impactful and honoring. So thank you for this opportunity and allow my words to be helpful and most importantly, in alignment with your truth. And I pray these things in your name. Amen. So as we take a look at work... It's not far into the Bible where we actually see our beginning teachings and examples of work. It's actually in the very first chapter of the very first book of the Bible. And in it, we see God is working over six successive days or six successive periods of times. He, he is working, working and working. On the seventh day he rests, we're going to talk about that later, later in this series, but he's working and he's doing things like separating the waters. He's calling light in the darkness. Actually, light out of darkness. Actually, the first day he's forming dry land. He's having swimmy things inside of the waters. He's having creeping and crawling things on top of the earth. He's creating men and women. And as he does this, frequently at the end of each day, he says this. So God saw that it was good. What was good? The thing that he had created was good, and the thing that he was doing was good. What was he doing? He was working. He was working. So we have to understand right now that many of us have a real difficulty with work, and we think that if only life was a little bit better, I wouldn't have to work, or I wouldn't have to work as hard. We have a bad attitude about work in general, and we're not doing as good a work as we could do because we have a bad attitude about it. I have my little Chipotle thing that they've been serving. I had some Chipotle this last week. You know what Chipotle does, any consumer products company or anybody who's trying to sell you and I something, they want to make the consumer feel good. They want to uh, stroke the beliefs that we have. They want to woo us back to them by thinking that they're like us and we want to have a good experience with them. So they only put stuff on their materials that will resonate with us, like this quote. Hope that in future all is well. Everyone eats free. No one must work. All just sit around feeling love for one another. <laughs> now, doesn't that sound like a great future? No, it's an awful future. I'm not against like loving, feeling love for one another, but the, the inherent shared belief that we have growing in our society is for me to feel love for one another means that we wouldn't have to be bothered with this thing called work. Work is somehow less than. Work is somehow not good. And if God did it, then it was good. God worked and it was good. And it was good. When I look back at all the work experiences I've had, I've seen things that God did in me that were good. And I encourage you to do this yourself. Do an 
inventory of any jobs that you've had, I'm sure you'll find ways that it shaped your character. My very first job was delivering papers. And uh, I learned the discipline of doing the same repetitive tasks every day with consistency. That's what a job is, right? Every day hitting the same nail. Oh, it's raining out. Too bad. Deliver the papers on your bike in the rain. Oh, I don't want to keep track of my accounts because I know oh, too bad. You're going to have to pay your paper manager. I mean, it was just that consistency that I was able to grow in. My next job was working at Hardee's. That's back when fast food workers wore orange and brown polyester. All polyester all the time. And in that non-breathable fabric, I had to stand over a, a, a flaming deal, fresh broiled flame, whatever the heck it was. That was old school, like flames coming up through grates. And I'd take the frozen patties and pat, 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 slap them down, pat, 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 pat. And then try to have contests to see who could flip the most hamburgers at the same time. And I remember just baking while my clothes were melting around me. And <laughs> then later on at night, I would close. And so I had to go to the fryers. I had this like big bucket thing. You'd put it down on the ground. You'd open the valve. All this previously boiling grease comes down inside the thing. You put a cover on it. You snap the cover. You pick it up. I don't know what it was, 70 pounds or something like that. You're carrying it to the back. Someone opens the door for you. You go over to this big um, BP Valdez kind of like uh, um, oil thing. And, and you'd have to take off the top and pour it in there. And this specific night I'm thinking of, I neglected to wear my rubber apron and I missed. And I had second degree burns too close to my privates. Just oh, <laughs> close, but not there. Wonderful. Thank you, Jesus. So it was just, man, <laughs> second degree burns. And I learned there every day was difficult. There was never an easy day working in the kitchen at a fast food place. And I learned the value of just enduring through difficulty. Another job I had, I was uh, moonlighting, uh, doing another job, and it was with a caterer. And I was just doing sort of some grunt work with this caterer, serving things and such. And it, this job gave me my first forceful entry into the world of diversity. Up at that point, I was only with people like me. And this catering company was owned by partners uh, who were lovers. Uh, uh, they were gay. And it was my first um, entrance into being around people who weren't like me. And it was great for me. So I working in construction. And while I was doing construction, I would have to do really rough stuff. At the beginning, it was backfilling foundations, sometimes with clods of mud if the backhoe couldn't get up the hill. Or it could be tearing off a roof, or it could be re-roofing something, or it could be siding something, later on doing cabinet work. And what I loved about those jobs is when I walked away at the end of the day, I could turn around and go, hmm, I did that. Good point. You go, mm, I did that. It was satisfaction. Today, with my job, many days I walk away and I turn around and I can't see anything. I see a calendar that was filled, but there's not like tangible, tactile things that have come out of my work. But that's served me well because now in my current jobs or other ministry jobs I've had, it's people work. It's people work. And now all the things that God had taught me in all the other jobs, he's using right now. Same repetitive things, enduring through difficulty, working on stuff that's going to have lasting value, being with people who are different. All of this is important. What do we learn with this? Three big ideas. Number one, when we work, we get to be like God. We work to be like God. God creates on the sixth day men and women, Adam and Eve. And when he creates Adam and Eve, he gives them responsibilities. In other words, he sets them to work. Because if God works, he wants his children to work. So he sets them to work. In Galatians, Genesis 1, chapter, chapter 1, verse 28, it says this. And God blessed them, and God said to them, Be fruitful and multiply, fill the earth, and subdue it. So that's some good work right there, fruitful, being fruitful and multiplying. That'd be some fun work. So that's, that's work that they were doing. They're also subduing the earth. Now, what does it mean to subdue the earth? Now, we've got to fast forward about a chapter or so to let you know, in the next chapter or so, sin is going to enter the world. Adam and Eve are going to do the one thing God tells them not to do. They eat fruit. When they rebel, as a result of this sin, there is a can of just awful stuff that gets into the environment. This is when people start killing each other. This is when cancer starts forming. This is when uh, divorces start happening. This is when pollution starts taking place. Anything that is not of heaven, that happens on earth, 
happens as a result of Adam and Eve doing the things that God doesn't want them to do. But this is all before that. So before anything bad is happening on the earth, they're working. They're working. Before, there's people working in kids club right now would love to hold a baby. There's people working. It's hard to, it's hard. Where am I? Uh, working. What was I just saying? Help me. You in the bright yellow shirt. Bring, bring me back. What was I just saying? You are in, you're in the front row. You're not even listening. You can't remind me what I was just saying. Whoa, there we go. Work, yes, yes. They were working, working before there was any evil that comes into the earth. And interesting, it says here part of their work thing was subdue. You actually look like interested. You're sitting there going. And then you can't remember what I said. But so what does it mean they're subduing the earth? When, by subduing the earth, it doesn't mean that the earth is out of control. The earth isn't out of control at this point. By subduing the earth, what this means is that they are to create culture in the earth. Really important thing. The earth starts in a garden. The Bible starts in a garden, Garden of Eden. And it ends in the city of God. In the book of Revelation, in the end of time, we see heaven likened to a city, not a garden. I'm sure in heaven there will be trees. God loves trees. But we see this progression happening where we are to bring culture and civilization into being. So how does that happen? Adam and Eve are to work for it. There's to do proper management systems. God hasn't told them how to manage the earth. They've got to figure that out. They've got to figure out how to do rows of crops and how far apart to, to space seeds. They've got to figure all that out. They've got to figure out stuff like the culture needs. Like, hmm, if I take this piece of wood and hollow it out and take a tendon from a deer, I can make a string and we can create music. Part of culture. Men and women had to invent that and work for that stuff. Had to invent and work for, hmm, we ought to actually, God hasn't downloaded all knowledge into our brains. He's given us brains to function. But we need to start some system to where we learn and accumulate knowledge and we teach and disseminate it. That is work. This is part of subduing or filling creation or creating culture. It happens through work. And what is God doing right now, by the way? So it's six days. What do you do after those six days of work? If you're a deist... George Washington, Ben Franklin were likely deists, which is God was around at one point. He created and worked something, but he was sort of like the big watchmaker who cranked things up. And then once the watch was set in motion, he stepped back and he's not involved. No, God worked for those six days. And today he's still working. He works. Jesus takes his cue from his heavenly father. In John chapter 5, 17, he says, my father is always at work up to the present time. And I, too, am working. He's working. Right now he's working. In fact, many of us are here right now as a result of God's work. Maybe you're here right now and you're going, how did I get here today? This is crazy. Well, God perhaps worked to get you here. He started working with somebody else to have them invite you here or some such thing. It's God's work. I don't know all the things that God does to work, but I know he's working. One of the big questions we have is how can God allow bad things to happen to good people? It's a good question. I have a bigger question. How is it that there's not more bad things happening in the world? God's working really hard to not have more runaway freight trains hit people. He's working really hard for there not to be more influenza viruses that are happening. I mean, it's been a long, long time since there's been a plague in the world. Long time. I think that's partially because I think God's working. I don't know all, what all God's doing. All I'm saying is this. God is working. And if you want to get closer to God and you want to have a life that is in sync with the rhythms of the world that he's created, you and I have to get back to valuing work. I watched a video this last week. I uh, recommend it. It's pretty interesting. I put it on, I'm having it put on our Facebook page. You can check it out. It's all about how automation has changed our work as people. And there's a new wave coming, not just automation changing our work, but actually computer thinking is changing our work and ultimately going to lessen the number of jobs that are here. I don't know when it's going to be. I don't know if it's going to be um, 50 years from now, 30 years from now, 100 years from now, but there's no question that the computer is making less and less of us necessary to work. And we're going to come today. This isn't the video, but I, I think it's true myself. We're going to come to a day, no question, 70% of us will just not have a job. That is going to happen. I don't know when it's going to happen, but it's going to happen. If you choose to watch this 15-minute video, you might be like most people who look at it and go, oh my goodness, gosh, how, how would I support myself? What would happen to the economy? 
That would be, I mean, if, if 70% of people are out of work, the, what happens to the people who have jobs? Is the taxation rate going to be 70% of their income in order to help everybody else? What's going to There's obviously some massive economic realities to that day as it comes closer and closer to us. But my first blush when I took a look at it was, wow, that would really wreak spiritual havoc on a nation if people weren't working. How would people sense a connection with God? How would people feel useful? How would people feel necessary? How would people feel like they have any value at all versus just consuming? That would be just ridiculous. That would be awful. And we think these ways. We don't think this way because we've been devaluing work. And a large part why we've been devaluing work is that we've devalued serving other people. We live in a consumer orientation society. We're not just where we buy products and goods, but we want other people to be giving us what we want. We want to consume other people's labor instead of giving labor to bless others. And this is the second big idea. We work to serve others. At its base, I think this is what work is. Work is serving others. We'll talk about pleasure and play in a couple weeks. I'm looking forward to that. That's important to have that. The difference between pleasure and work is when we work, we serve others, and when we play, we serve ourselves. And we need to serve ourselves a certain amount of time. But work is different than that because work is all about serving somebody else. And this is um, a little bit difficult for us. Some of us in some of our jobs are going to struggle thinking through how is it that I serve people? I mean, if you're a plumber, it should be pretty easy. Man, I unclog pipes so houses don't stink and that serves people. And I'm getting money for that. Wonderful. But I'm serving people. Or... If you're a waitress, waiter, you're, what are you doing? You're giving refills to give people a good time. You're serving them, and you're getting a paycheck at the same time. Some occupations are really simple to figure out what the serving angle is. Others might be a little more difficult. You're in a cube. You're in a cube crunching numbers. And you've got to figure out a way, how am I serving to make sure the Q3 report is accurate? That's a little more difficult, but you need to be able to figure out how to do that. Maybe you're serving your boss who's got a gun to his head to make it work. Maybe you're serving shareholders who have put money in the company and they need to make sure it's managed properly. I don't know what it is. If you're a teacher, you're serving that child, serving the mental process of the child, not serving necessarily your future, but serving them. At its heart, all work is about service. It's about service. It's about being like God and serving others. Matthew 20, 28, Jesus says this. It says, The Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. Jesus served the point of going to the cross and dying for sins that I committed so I don't have to die myself eternally. What would it look like if this verse was written a little differently? I think the same intent would be there. If it says something like, The Son of Man came not to be worked for, but to work and to give his life as a ransom for many. This is what Jesus did. He worked. He worked. All through his life, he worked. Then you might say, I don't remember Jesus working. Because if you're only viewing work as getting a paycheck, there's nothing in the Bible that shows him getting a paycheck. The Bible focuses on his age, age 30 to 33. And in that span of time, there's no record of him getting a paycheck. Now, we're very confident that up until 30, he got a lot of paychecks. He was a builder. He was a builder. And so he was working and he was getting paid. But while he was working, he was serving people, making things for them, building things for them, and in the process getting paid. That's wonderful. It's awesome to get paid. I'm just saying at baseline, work is about serving somebody else. And the pay is also very important to God. It's very important to us. There's nothing wrong with that. But if we're only, I owe, I owe, it's off to work I go. If that's the only reason we're working, that's a favorite bumper sticker. Guess what? Our work is not going to be fulfilling. We're not going to be working like a boss. We're going to be working like a weenie. <laughs> be the first person to be laid off. The last person to get promoted. The last person anyone wants to be around because of just devaluing this process of work. Jesus, more scholars are thinking, you know, maybe the reason why he never passed a bag, even though he talked about money a lot, he never passed a bag, he never raised money. Maybe the reason was, this is all conjecture, was because he made so much money up to age 30 that he bankrolled his whole operations from 30 to 33. Because nowhere else in the entire Bible, ever in the Bible, is, is there anything happening without raising of money, having people give. And nowhere we see actually in the history of the world does that not happen either, the history of what God does. It's a regular thing. There's something weird that happened to Jesus for those three years. And people just surmise, he must have worked hard enough and well enough and served well enough that he made some jack 
that bankrolled him and his buddies traveling around for three years and doing X, Y, Z. Now, this is all conjecture. All I'm trying to say is this. I'm trying to say this. Whether Jesus was getting a paycheck or whether he wasn't getting a paycheck, he worked. He was working building things and he was working building people. He was working sanding this thing and he was working teaching that person. He was no stranger to work. What do we call our work? We call it a vocation. Do you realize even just by saying, my vocation is a carpenter, my vocation is a salesperson, my vocation is real estate, whatever that thing is, even by saying vocation, we're tapping into the divine origin of work. Here's a definition of vocation in the dictionary. Vocation, a divine call to God's service or to the Christian life, a function or station in life to which one is called by God. This comes from the Latin word vocare, which is to call, to summon. We have to get to a place, friends, where we feel like my job, my work, I'm called and I'm summoned to it. I'm called and, I'm, I'm called and summoned to fold laundry as a stay-at-home parent. It's grueling and it's backbreaking. Or I'm called and I'm summoned to make cold calls because there's something that people need to know about and have the opportunity to buy. Or I'm called and summoned to be a professor because somebody has to be able to build into people's future with education because to go forward, you have to have, Or I'm called and summoned. I don't know what it is. I don't know what it is. But we have to get to a point where we're not expecting some mystical fog to fall on us with the perfect job that makes us feel good every day, and it's a perfect job that we'll put on Facebook and let people know how cool we are because we have this cool, cool job, or it's the perfect job that we're proud to tell somebody about at our 10th year reunion from high school, but it's simply a job that we know we're serving somebody, and we serve them, we're like God, and because of that, there's a calling I have to this. There's a, there's a purity, there's a, there's a beauty to it. And this is not where we are today as a culture. I mean, I don't care if you're an atheist, agnostic, what your spirituality is, whatever your take on is on spirituality, religion, we should all be pretty united as Americans that America is getting less and less interested in God. We all have different cultural factors we can look at and say, well, there's more of that. God's not into that. There's less of that. God's into that. I mean, just about anybody would say, yeah. Honoring God, if you believe him, he, she, it, or not, is becoming less and less in vogue. And I think this goes right in line with our attitude towards work, our decreasing desire to work. The Gallup organization last year, they ran a massive, massive study to find out how many of us, when we're at work, we actually work. They found out 30% of us, when we were at work, we were actively engaged in work. 52% were in work, we are not engaged. And the rest, 18%, are actively disengaged. You are engaged at work. They define as if you show up and you do what you're supposed to do and you focus on it and you're all in. You're distant, you're not engaged if you're at work and whenever you can, you're checking social media, you're surfing the web. Oh, you know, I, got, I had to leave like an hour late today, so tomorrow I'll come in 62 minutes late. You're just sort of disengaged or you're actively disengaged. You're, you're intentionally subverting the culture of your environment. You're intentionally talking trash about the box. You're intentionally like spending time on the computer, not doing work things when you could. 18%. It's just not good, and it's a desire of our waning work ethic and our waning connection with God. And there's other signs as well. There's, we actually diss on people. We have racist comments towards people who serve better than we do. I'm talking about Hispanics, our Hispanic population. You know, we're like, oh, they're doing, it's a Mexican job, they're Hispanic. We look down on people that look different than us if those of us are white and black versus, I don't know, what's Hispanic, what do we call Hispanic? Uh, Tan color, whatever. We look down. We look down on people who have an amazing work ethic. D.L. Hewley talked about this, uh, African-American comedian. He said, you know what? I'll try to do my impersonation. He said, you know what? People keep talking about trying to build a wall between Mexico and the United States. We want to keep out, keep out the Mexicans. Like, keep those people away from us. Build a long wall. And he, he goes, this, let me ask you something. Who's going to build the wall? They got to build the wall. Hey, all you Mexicans, oh, y'all wall yourselves in over there. He said, we don't know how to build a wall any longer. <laughs> We've lost all the possibilities of how to build a wall. It's true. Man, when's the last time you went to a, past a blue-collar construction site? And notice, my goodness, what is it that those jobs aren't beneath those folks? They're not complaining about X, Y. It's, and we, we make fun of that. It's a, it's, it's a sign. It's not a good sign for us. We also, we also take a look at 
the ultimate fantasy that we have as Americans that we're drilled into from early in our time, that the goal of work is to not work. It's called retirement. <laughs> goal of work is to not work. That's ridiculous. That's crazy. Now, I believe, I totally agree and believe, and especially the older I get, the older I get, the more I realize, like, yeah, there's going to come a day where I'm not going to be able to earn as much money as I am right now, so I have to be prepared for that. I like a, a local business executive I read in the Business Courier the other day. He calls it not retirement, but rewirement. A need to recognize that at some point, your income capacity is going to be less, your physical ability is going to be less, and actually, someone's going to push you out of the workforce. Hey, man, when you're 50 and you're starting to get bummed out, someone's pushing you out of the workforce, just recognize, someone who's 50 got pushed out when you were 25, and it wasn't bad then. It's just bad now. I'm not saying it's right. I'm just saying we have to have our eyes open and realize, yeah, there's going to come a day where I'm not going to be able to make the kind of money that I'm used to, and I need to adjust for that. But we have this fixation with retirement. It's like our holy birthright. When the, uh, when the Great Recession initially hit, most of the articles I read, most of the sob stories were about people who now had to work who were about to retire. It wasn't about, as much about people who were having a hard time putting food on the table so over and over again, oh, I was going to retire next year. Now I can't retire. Oh, I was retired. Now I have to go back to work. It's, it's just, it's not a good sign. Here's a question for us. Think about all the old retired people you know who, who decided they're, they're living wonderful lives, watching more soap operas and chasing a white ball around a field of green. You know, when you think about people who are old, there's two types of people who are old and retired. One, those people who you like to be around. And two, those people you don't like to be around. <laughs> Isn't it true? Like, man, old people can be ornery and crotchety, and they can, they can be annoying. Is that right? I mean, are you thinking about somebody right now who's like that? Yeah. Go ahead and tell the person next to you who that person is. Let's, let's go. <laughs> let's have some pastor-sanctioned gossip right now. Just lean next to you and say, who is it? No. Okay, stop. That's enough. Now, now, here's the thing. As you thought about those people, the old people that you want to be around and the old people that you don't want to be around, here's the difference. The old people that you want to be around are still working. You go, no, wait a minute, no, they're, they're, they haven't been on payroll for a while. No, but they're serving. They're serving. The peop, old people you don't want to be around, when they stopped working in the workforce, all the self-governors that hid their selfishness just went away. So they had all these things, I really can't say what I think I'm going to say right now because if I really said that, I'd get fired. Well, guess what? I'm not working long, so I'll just say it. <laughs> Oh, man, I, gotta, I actually got to pretend like I'm interested in people else. I won't get invited to this opportunity. I won't have this. Now it's like, I don't care. I don't need to please anybody. I'll just do or say whatever I want. And now the selfishness, the lack of service just is put out there. And therefore, we're not receiving it because they're not working, meaning they're not serving. This really clicked for me just this last week. My, my father-in-law had a... Um, my my mother-in-law and father-in-law are amazing heroes to me. They're phenomenal folks. And uh, they've been having some health issues. And the most recent one is my father-in-law had a, um, uh, it came out, no, I keep wanting to say hysterectomy, but that's not the right one. I, I do want to keep saying, it's an H word down in that region that men would have. Uh, hernia, there, hernia. He had, he had, out, out of nowhere, he had this hernia pop up on him. So now it's, he's, he's had to go to the hospital. He's staying there long because they've had some complications. He's going to be fine. Pray for him if you want to. That'd be great. His name is Roger. So while he was in there, my, uh, my wife Libby went up to check him out after the first day and see what was happening. And she had made an interesting observation. She said, you know what's interesting? Whenever I go see my parents in the hospital, there's always like nurses are all, 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 always hanging out in their room. That's interesting because, you know, budget cutbacks with hospitals and such. There's less help to go around and such. And all, we know all about all those problems. But yet, there seems to always be nurses just kind of hanging around in my in-law's room. Why is that? And she said, here's why it is. She says, because when nurses come in, they're serving the nurses. They come in whereas many people would say, I just need this, I need that, I need this, maybe a thank you. Nurse comes in the room and says, hi, what's your name? Are you married? Do you have any kids? They get in a conversation about their kids. They say, we'll pray for your kids. They come in with to serve the food, and they'll try to help them take the food off the tray. When they're done eating on the little thing on the bed that's coming up over the thing, when they're done eating, what do they do? They take all the paper. They put it on one corner of the tray, 
And they take all the plates and they put all the food on one plate and put it on top of the rest of the plates. Why? Because they're serving whoever is going to be washing the dishes. They're trying to make it easy for them. They do this all the time. So even though my father-in-law, Roger, has not had a paycheck job for over 15 years, he's never stopped serving. And as a result of that, everyone loves him because people like people who work. Why is that? Because God works. Because when we work, we're tapping into something of the divine. And there's something attractive about that. We also see signs that, and by the way, I'm talking about this, this retire. There's not a lot of us in here. I'm not, this is not like my time to crack on those of us who are 65 and retired. I'm not, I mean, there's a very pretty young crowd. I, all I'm trying to do is this. This is just an example of when we don't value work. It's a societal example. of When we don't value work, there's ramifications, the repercussions for it. And just as one of many, many examples. I caught this on WebMD this last week. Check it out. Uh, a study of Shell Oil employees shows that people who retire at age 55 and live to be at least 65 die sooner than people who retire at 65. And after age 65, the early retirees have a 37% higher risk of death than counterparts that retired at 65. That's not all. People who retire at 55 are 89% more likely to die in the 10 years after retirement than those who retire at 65. In other words, if I understand that properly, if you want to die 10 years earlier, <laughs> retire 10 years earlier. That's a, if I read that, that's basically the statistic. Why is it? Because God's not wound us to unplug from work. And you can be retired, not be collecting a paycheck, but you can still be working. You can still be serving. One of the ways that we serve is when you're working someplace, not getting paid. Or on Crossroads, we have various ministry opportunities that you can serve. And our last study that we did, last survey we took on this, we found out that of everyone who comes to Crossroads, 76.1% of everyone who comes to Crossroads is not on a regular serving team, meaning 76.1% of everyone at Crossroads is not working. And this doesn't just have impact on our potential as a community. It also has impact on our personal spirituality, on our ability really to connect with God. My daughter... This last week, last, after the uh, last school year, she's going into her junior year, so she said to Lib and I, I said, hey, uh, I want to take this summer class this summer. I looked at her like, who are you? I, <laughs> are you kidding? I mean, this is a normal thing. Kids are starting to figure out, hey, if I take it in the summer, I can cram some classes together. It might be an easier pace. I might be able to set myself up for this or that. that when I was a kid, that was the furthest thing from my mind, actually learning something in the summer. That's the last thing I wanted to do. So I tried to understand it, and Liv and I talked about it, and I said, we said to her, look, honey, if you want to, um, if you want to take that class, that, that's fine, but you, you have to work this summer. You have to, you, we, we just decided and figured out for your personal and spiritual development, you just have to have a job. So if you can have a job and do that, that's great. So she, uh, she went out and got her job. She didn't do the class, but she went out and got her job. She uh, worked the takeout window at Skyline. And uh, by the way... The more I think about it, she's yet to bring home crackers for me from Skyline. I'm not, I'm not getting any free little noodles with like brownie stuff on top. I'm not getting any of that stuff. I'll have to figure out why that is. But why was that important? It's because we know that she needed to produce something. Even if it's handing through the window something somebody else has done and said, voila, five way, it's producing. <laughs> Even if it's looking at my bank account that I now need and I see the digits in there are increasing, I'm producing wealth for her. Production is critical. It's the third and final thing. We work to produce. Adam and Eve were put in the garden to produce a culture, to produce. Jesus was put on the earth to produce a righteous life so that salvation could be produced for people like you and I. There's nothing wrong with production. It's necessary. It's part of what work is. And actually, anything, anything that you want to produce will always be tied to work. You want to make more money? Do more work. <laughs> you want to produce more money in your bank account? Do more work. People say, well, I'm Marty, Mar Mar working smarter. It's interesting that people who are really big on working smarter are also big on not working hard. It's interesting how that works. Fine, work smart, definitely. And if you want more money, work harder. I'm not against the lottery. I'm not 
against blackjack. I've played blackjack a good number of times. But don't ever do those things in order to get money. You will not get money doing those things. If you want to get more money, work. Because that is how money is produced. It's produced through work. If you've got a relationship that's starting to kindle and you're starting to date somebody and you really want it to grow, you want to produce a great relationship, it's going to take work. It's the same actually kind of work if you're married. If you want to produce a great marriage relationship, it's going to take work. What's it mean to work? Well, you have to figure out, okay, when's the regular times we're going to go out to eat, just you and I? You're going to have to work. Like when the person says something that's stupid and you disagree with, you're going to have to work to not go... You're going to have to work to go. (laughs) That's going to take work. It's going to take work to figure out, all right, what can I say that's encouraging to this person? It's going to take work to say, oh, they want to do it. I don't know what it's going to take. I'm telling you, if you want to produce a great relationship, it's going to take work. The mysteries of God. If you want to produce a great relationship with God where you understand more of the mysteries of who he is, where for some strange reason when you pray, more yeses are said by God and those things start happening. If you want to produce a great relationship with God, it's going to take work. Work. If you're a morning person, it's going to mean every morning you're going to have to read the Bible. If you're oh, I'm not a morning person, good. Every night before you go to the Bible, before you go to bed, you're going to have to read the Bible. You're going to have to work at saying... Spending time on your knees and just being quiet, going, I just want to submit myself to you, God, out of humbleness. I'm going to sit here by my couch and be quiet. And your mind drifts, but every once in a while you might sense, "Mm, maybe that's God right there. And it's going to take work to focus your mind and meditate. It's going to take work. You're going to have to work on figuring out a prayer life. Take work. I interact with people who go, man, I just don't like to pray. I'm praying with people, praying out loud. It's not something I do. I'm an introvert. I don't like to pray with other people. What do you think? Extroverts naturally go, whoo, let's pray out loud. Wonderful. (laughs) Nobody likes to pray out loud initially. Nobody. No one is able to pray in groups of people. The people who are able to do it are able to do it because they worked at it. They worked at it. And there's not a movement of God, as I've researched, there's not a movement of God in in history that hasn't had bunches of people coming together in corporate prayer. And we do it to work it, not just to pray about it, but to work about it. Everything that's produced in the Bible, work, producing a temple, producing a wall around Jerusalem, producing a a, a new covenant community in the New Testament, producing missionaries, it's work, it's effort. And it's because we want to be like our dad, our heavenly father, and we want to serve. Last verse for us today. Galatians, Colossians, excuse me, 3, verse 23 to 24. Whatever you do, work heartily, ask for the Lord, and not for men. Knowing that from the Lord, you'll receive the inheritance as your reward. You are serving the Lord Christ. Whatever you do, whatever you do, whatever you do, whether it's serving someplace unpaid, whether it's Fixing a joint on a plumbing line, whether it's, whether, it's, whether it's teaching a kid, work heartily unto the Lord. Work hard. Flush out that pipe, serving somebody else, working heartily unto the Lord. When you're putting a torque wrench on, the lug nut as a mechanic, work heartily unto the Lord, knowing I'm serving somebody's safety here so that a lug nut doesn't come flying off and hurt other people. Work heartily unto the Lord. When you are managing somebody and you're realizing you have to fire them, Work heartily on the Lord by giving them the real truth in loving ways and do it in such a way as to protect everybody else who's still working because that person might hurt everybody else. And do it working heartily on the Lord. When you're going through your lesson plans in the front of the classroom, don't just go into automotive pilot. And I know automotive pilot, what that can look like as a teacher. Don't go there. Bring your best to class every day, all of your creative energies, whatever you can to make that lesson work. And do it, Why? Because you want to connect with God, you want to serve others, and you want to work heartily on the Lord because you're trying to produce people that wouldn't be produced if it wasn't for your work. You can give me any job that we have in here, and I'll tell you, this works. Work heartily on the Lord. And in the process, you'll be serving. In the process, you're going to find out you're going to be more like God than you ever anticipated. God, thank you for being patient with lazy people like us. Thank you for being patient with people who devalue your, uh, your modeling. I'm, I'm thankful that you never ask us to do anything you're not already doing. And you're already a great worker. You've done it well, and you're still doing it for us. Thank you. You're just good. Help the right applications to take place in every life in here come tomorrow morning or this afternoon.
Amen. Right now is an application. I've got a great application for this. We're going to bring up our campus pastor here in Oakley, Chuck Mingles. Welcome, Chuck. All right, so for this application, two things. One, if you have your smartphone, go ahead and take it out. You're going to need that in a moment. And if you don't have your smartphone but you got a program, turn to the back card that says Serve In, and we're going to talk about an application that's relevant for this team called Crossroads Oakley. I'll tell you, when I got connected with Crossroads 14 years ago, one of the things that I realized from being around here is the incredible benefit that I got from doing work for which I wasn't paid. And that was a volunteer. For me, that looked like getting involved with kids. And I learned two things coming out of that time. One was, I need this. That was an incredibly developmental thing for me personally. It impacted me spiritually. It impacted me skill-wise. It helped me to communicate more clearly. It helped me in many ways for the things that I'm doing today and the things I was doing at P&G back then. It was an incredible development opportunity for me. And the other thing I realized is the more and more you spend time around Crossroads, and in Oakley particularly, you'll find out we are workers You're surrounded by people who work, who roll up their sleeves and get involved. And let me tell you something. When I hear that 76% of people who come to Oakley aren't involved in regular work around here in the things that we do in ministry, it bums me out. And it bums me out because you're missing out. That was the way that I got connected in community. That was the way I had a sense of things beyond myself. I grew spiritually. And I want that for all of us. I certainly want that for the 76% of us who aren't doing that right now. And it's also the fact that we miss out. We miss out on the unique things that you do, the unique thumbprint you can have on this campus. So here's the application right now. It takes 500 people to make Kids Club happen every weekend. It takes 500 people to make student ministry and Kids Club happen. And I want to put you to work. I want you to get put to work. So text number is going to show up on the screen right now. And if you are not actively engaged in a serving team around here, if you're not one of the workers making things happen, I want you to text 393-9551 and say, put me to work. We want to put you to work in working with kids. We want to put you to work and work with students. And it doesn't mean you have to be in the classroom. There are other ways to engage. If you're logistically minded, there are places where you can serve in that way as well. But I want to put you to work. We want you to work because of what it will produce in you spiritually, what it will produce in you in terms of the fruit that you'll see as you get involved in things that matter ultimately. I think things that matter eternally. And so what's going to happen is hopefully now as you're texting and sending that, you're going to get a response, and that response will provide you with a link where you can fill out additional information and be a part of the team of workers who are making things happen around here. Because the reality is this series on work is going to be awesome. And I want all of us to be able to fully lean into it and learn what it means to work like a boss. So we'll see you guys next week. Thanks for being here.